Good morning. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, being here and your interest in Georgia's implementation of Drupal. Well, Georgia definitely made some news about five years ago when we decided to join the Drupal community, and not just for like a site for a couple sites, but for this entire web enterprise platform. So it was pretty exciting right back then because we were embracing something that was just catching up in the federal space, but none of the states had done that, or even the local governments. When we did our research, there were few instances that we saw where Drupal was being implemented, but nothing to the scale of what we were looking for. So it, it, was, pretty, it was pretty exciting for us as well. And back in the day, we, we kind of had done some projections based on our solution that we were proposing, right, internally within the organization. And um, we had talked about it out in the open, so clearly there was like a lot of expectations. And uh, last year or so, I started getting a lot of calls from other organizations, other states, local governments saying, yeah, how's that going? You know, back in the day, everything was, everything was, you guys were, you know, promising rainbows and unicorns. I'm pretty sure, you know, technology project, come on, like, how's it going? So I figured, like, this would be a good time to just kind of start talking about, like, what we have been going through, what we have been doing, what we, you know, are planning on doing going forward. So again, like really thrilled to have this opportunity to you know, come here and just kind of circle up and talk about what we have been doing and what our you know, ROI has been going to Drupal. Um, so I'm Nikhil Deshpande. I am the director for Georgia Gov Interactive uh, within the Georgia Technology Authority. So Georgia Technology Authority is like the technology arm within the state of Georgia. And um, any other technology-based consulting or technology providing that needs to be done within the state, my agency does. But I'm, I'm not a Drupal developer or a Drupal person, um, because back when we were decided to kind of go Drupal, I, I didn't know anything about it, other than the fact that, you know, hey, this is something that, you know, other organizations that are like us are using as a solution. Uh, I'm also not a, like a financial person. I'm not a financial analyst. I'm not a number cruncher, even though part of my talk is going to be about the whole ROI aspect of it. But definitely what my job is, is to find the right solution. So I'm a strategist. I'm a digital strategist. And you know, my background has been in user experience. So looking at what our users need and how we are serving those needs, it's my job to find the right solution. And, and this is kind of, you know, where I was put in this place to be the link between, you know, the solution group and the suits, right? So got to have to talk like both languages to kind of connect the dots and make things happen. One of the primary things that we do in um, our team is have Georgia.gov up, live, and relevant. And just to kind of give you an idea, right, I mean, I know that some of you have um, connections and ties to Georgia, but Georgia is like a state of about 10.2 million residents. And obviously everything is centered around Atlanta being the capital as far as the state government's concerned, but Atlanta as a city is just about 445,000 people. But that's just the city of Atlanta. But the metro of Atlanta is about 5.2 million. So as you can tell right there, right, there's a lot of government that happens around that. Like there are different cities that, find, that form Metro Atlanta, and obviously there are different counties. If you guys don't know, Georgia is like the second largest in the number of counties after Texas. We have 159 counties. That's a lot for the size of the state, right? So clearly, there is a lot of confusion when it comes to how do I deal with the government? And that's where Georgia.gov comes in place. Like, we don't want people to understand, like, if this is a county function, if this is a city function or a state function, you go here. If you are a resident of Georgia, you go here, and we will give you at least the basic answer that you're looking for and where you need to go for this. So this is, this is a content issue 
and this is not a technology issue, but this is essentially what our vision was. And then that vision also was that based on this, because we are being like a centralized place to answer our constituents' questions, we also need to have a centralized place for our state agencies to host their web presence. So this is, this is not new. This was put in place back in 2002 where we were all centralized IT for the state of Georgia. But only back then, we had logins to multiple HTML sites and we used to update static content. And in 2002, we moved to a CMS system and that's when we started making sure everything was kind of structured and everything was a little cohesive. But, you know, it was, it was again, 2002, it, wasn't, it was not an open source CMS, it was a proprietary CMS. But the issue here is that these services that we offer are not mandated. I know that in some states, some organizations, if you have a centralized IT, all the rest of the organization is required to use those. We are not. So we're essentially competing with anybody, right? We are competing with IBM, we're competing with Accenture, we're competing with the person sitting in Starbucks, you know, who can pull up a website and who can create a WordPress site. So it, 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 was, it was fine. I mean, that was the premise, that was our challenge, right? So we had to find a solution that was scalable, that was elastic enough, that we could be competitive enough. We could be competitive when it came to web publishing platforms that we created for our state agencies, also for the professional services. Because agencies don't have, you know, UX people, they don't have content specialists and strategists, we do, but we work with them. So you work with them in partnership to make sure their web presence is, is really up to speed, it's, it's per the best industry standards, and as much as we act as a vendor and a partner with our state agencies, we can also have a centralized visibility into the overall presence. So that also gives us a little bit of a governance um, aspect of what should we be doing? So we, not so much from a dictating perspective, but we bring people together as a community and we work with them to kind of make sure, you know what, these are the best practices. Please don't use Flash. You know, please don't use like scrollers on your website anymore. No one, no one really cares about like the count of how many visitors have you been, have, have you had on your website. But okay, it's important to you, they don't care. Take that, take that down, please. So anyway, things like these, you know, we, we work with them. So, the structure for this presentation is going to be pretty simple, right? So it's just going to be why Georgia moved to Drupal. And if some of you have been um, in any of my previous talks, you might have seen a little bit part of this is because this was essentially the drive for us to move to Drupal. Then I'm going to be talking a little bit about like how we are using Drupal right now. And then, you know, essentially the promise of this talk is what has been the ROI for us using Drupal. So going about like why Georgia moved to Drupal, I'm just gonna do a quick flashback of 2011, right? When we were in the middle of a technology crisis, right? I mean, you know, the, world, the, the rest of the world was celebrating the British royal wedding and you know, there were like a lot of other milestones happening around, but for us it was a little different, right? We were using a pretty old CMS system and you know, our, our operation costs were like through the roof. Right, because this was set in place in 2002. So our infrastructure, which was almost like nine years old then, or 10 years old, it was kind of crumbling, right? I mean, how long can servers just go without replacing parts? Our entire focus was just to make sure things don't break and things don't catch on fire. So there really there was no strategy, and that was hurting us. And in, in return, it was hurting our customers. Because one thing up here is we have customers because we are centralized IT, we charge our agencies and we offer our services as a legit service offering that we can compete with anyone they can find on the street. So our customers were kind of unhappy. They were a little kind of concerned, like, where is this going? Um, because clearly their needs were changing as the time was passing and, and it affected my team, right? It affected, it affected everyone on the team. We were like, what are we doing here? Why aren't we just doing something different? So, the cost aspect of it was essentially because just a couple years ago, we tried to upgrade our CMS to the most recent version of what we were using, and it was just bad. It was terrible. So we moved some sites, 
up there and when we saw how bad it was, you know, we were like, nope, we're staying back. We're not moving the rest of the sites to the new version. And then guess what? We had two versions to manage, right? I always equate this to like Napoleon's march to Russia where they had no idea where they were going. And by the time they reached there, winter sucked in and like everyone was just shivering. They were not used to that kind of winter. And they were like, you know what? That's great, we're here, but let's go back. They started off with some half million soldiers. They went back with 10,000, right? So it was, it was really crazy the way things were happening back then. And also this was not an open source system. We had to pay licensing. We had to pay support every year. And that was always just you know, going up every year, and that was beyond our control. We also were in a self-hosted model. We hosted in, in our own data center. We were part of a huge set of servers which had super specific requirements, but they could not cater their services just for our requirements. So we had to like, check a bunch of boxes that were just not relevant for us. Right? But we had to pay everything because that's just how the pricing model was. So um, clearly that was also a big pain point for us as far as costs were concerned. And of course, you know, like I said, because we had two different CMSs, we had dedicated support staff. Because the two versions, even if it was the same CMS, were so significantly different that we could not just you know, upgrade our existing support staff to support two different versions. So you know, certainly our development staff had doubled. So clearly, you know, this, was, this was the cost aspect of it, but also the infrastructure aspect. Right? Like I said, we had 27 servers, which were you know, 10 years old. And I mean, you know, we can't even we can't even have like a good experience with cars that are 10 years old without us having to fix things and everything. Sometimes, like you know, this comes down, this blows up, change that. We had 99% uptime, right? So I mean, for someone who doesn't really know uptime, they're like, well, 99%. Come on, what are you complaining about? But that means you're like, at an annual base, you're like down for three days. Every day you're down for like 15 minutes. That's just not acceptable. Right? I mean, for us, for us, I mean, for a state to have sites down 15 minutes a day, that's just impossible to defend. And also, you know, everything was managed, right? So our server went down, we had to open a ticket and then wait. So there was like this feeling of helplessness of we want to do this, we want to change things, and, you know, it's just not going to happen. And clearly, you know, the signs of a sinking ship started showing. Our customers were like, you know, sorry, we gotta go. Joe is gonna build a site and you know, he's just gonna ma manage it. Yes, he lives in the basement, but he's still gonna be managing our site. So we started losing revenue. The team was kinda, you know, now split between half people thinking we should do something different and the people who were invested in the technology that we were using, they were like, yeah, I mean, we can make this work. We can make this work. Let's just stay the course, right? So. Overall, there was this huge divide within the team, and you know the morale and the engagement it, it was split. So it was it was a little concerning there. So the next step was obviously to look for a CMS, right? So this this is not going to work. We need to find something else. When we started looking at other CMSs, I mean, oh my God, right? I mean, it's like, what do you pick? Because right now we were so heads down on making sure our CMS doesn't blow up. You know, there were like so many other things that came up while we were just busy putting out fires. So we went the Gartner route and you know, we seeked advice and everyone pointed to like, well, you should be using you know, these because these are clearly in our magic quadrant. And you know, I was like, wait a minute, what we are using is in the magic quadrant, right? It's, it's like we need to do something different because granted that CMS, might work, it's just not working for us. So we had to find something that worked for us. So at that point our strategy was just keep the lights on, right? They would just like make sure nothing blows up, keep the, keep the lights on, because we had fell to this whole sunk cost fallacy. You know, the, the leadership was all about, well, we have invested so much in this CMS, make sure it works, just keep doing something. We don't want to invest in something else, just, just keep doing it, keep doing it. So essentially back then our strategy was farm bill. Like back in the day it seemed like the right thing to do, it seemed like, you know, well, what else can you do? But nah, you know, and no one was like actually open about, yeah, I'm on farm bill. Who can say here, they've been on farm bill? No one raises their hand, right? Like, 
It's, it's like, you know, there's something that you are aware of that like, I've been here for so many hours, I've got so many crops to harvest, you keep going back, you know it's, you know it's a time suck, and you, you, but still, you keep going back. So yeah, the, clearly that strategy was not, not to work. So, so looking at you know, what the landscape looked like, it was just like all kinds of CMSs, all kinds of focus that we were looking for. But I mean, clearly, you know, we had like a very specific filter system that we wanted to go and find what was going to work for us. And, and the biggest draw for us was to find something that was not expensive, that was not kludgy to manage, but also something that was like really well supported. So obviously, you know, the fact that I'm here, we ended up using Drupal. And these were like the four main filters that we applied. Like we had to find something which was robust enough to support our enterprise. We had to find something which was cost effective because we did not want to go back to the, the whole cost model that we, were, we felt like we were being held hostage to. And you know, we wanted to make sure that this was user friendly. And you know, we found Drupal extremely user friendly because again, like our user base was not that sophisticated enough to handle CMSs that required them to be at a certain technical level. And obviously, we wanted to find something that had a huge government presence. And you know, Drupal fit the bill for everything. But there was just one issue with that. It was open source. And back in 2011, still at the state level, I mean, people were not using open source at the scale we were trying to implement this. So we had to do a lot of education, right, about open source. And people started asking questions like, oh, come on, I mean, open source, uh, you know, how, how good is it? I know, like, everyone can just do whatever with it, right? It's open. How secure is it? I mean, you know, but wait a minute, it's free, so no money at all? Like, so everything that we're spending, everything is saved? So we're like, all right, so there has to be like certain education done, right? So we did all of that. We answered all of those questions. We put together a business case, right? In which we kind of did a pretty decent job of explaining that yes, open source free, not like free beer, it's more like a free speech. But honestly, if any of you are in the position to justify this, I don't think I mean, this is like way past, so I don't think we should be having this conversation. But the best analogy that I found, right, for open source was for, from Scott McNeely. Um, you know, he said, open source is free like a puppy is free. Yes, it's free. You can just go out on the street, pick it up. Then what, right? It's not like you just come and just put it on your mantle and it's there. I mean, there's a lot of, there is a lot of nurturing and care that needs to go in it to make sure it grows up to be a dog for what you want to you know, walk and what you want to have in your house, right? So it has to have that environment that you build to nurture open source. So now that we are on open source, I'm going to talk about like how are we using Drupal, right? So we did bring that puppy in our house, right? So the next thing we wanted to make sure that we nurture that puppy. It's not just enough to go and procure open source. So we built a platform. We built a platform that we started treating it as a product. We made sure that the platform was single code based, so we don't have to duplicate effort every time something needed to be changed or upgraded. But we also had a multi-site and a multi-database structure in place. As much as every agency who was on that platform were happy to be on a cohesive platform, they still wanted that wall in between them. Like, I don't want them to look at my things. Like, you're gonna be publishing that tomorrow anyways, but still, today, no. That's my thing, right? That's fine. I mean, these are some of the challenges that as a centralized IT, all of you must be facing if you're in that position. We also made it theme-based, so at least there was like a starting point for people to relate themselves to. The themes constituted are different look and feels. So it was all about, all right, I'm the governor's office. I want something red, white, and blue. But hey, I am community health. I want something soft. I want something friendly. But I'm GBI. I don't want something soft and friendly, right? I'm the Bureau of Investigation. I want something that's absolutely official, something that is a little bit of scary looking. So we had a bunch of themes that we offered to our agencies because 
we were moving 55 websites at the same time. We had a time frame of just 10 months to make that happen because our infrastructure was honestly so bad, our licensing was expiring, and we had no you know, appetite or the budget to renew it for another exorbitant amount of money for just next year because you know, we couldn't move those sites fast enough. So we had to build something that could just you know, consume that content and build a site fast enough and you know, let our old infrastructure just die out. But also while doing that, we were, we were really concerned about are we going to be responsive to the changing landscape of technology? Are we going to be accessible enough for all of the users that we were not so far? I mean, it was really shameful that we had like a M dot, like a mobile site for our rest of the websites that just showed our site map. Because our old technology just did not accommodate, you know, what the changes we were trying to do to make our older sites responsive. So we had to make sure like the, this, this new platform accommodated everything. So even before actually we started making any technology decisions, the first thing that we did was we had to change our strategy. We had to look at it from a very different perspective because the beauty of Drupal that we saw was that it was actually a solution to fit our strategy and we didn't have to fit our strategy to a solution. So our strategy always has been users first, content first, and mobile first, right? But in three different ways. Not everyone can be first, but in our planning stage, we always had users first. Because anything that we are doing, we have to be aware that it's end of the day for our users. Anything that we are designing, we have to make sure that we are designing for the content. We are not designing for the whims and fancies of you know, the, the leadership or the commissioners or the directors, right? Just because somebody likes blue or somebody likes red, that's great. You know, paint your rooms, bedrooms, or living rooms with that color. But for your website, if your users are expecting something, that they're looking for a certain content, I mean, yesterday, the keynote that you know, Sarah said was like so right, right? So many of our Georgians users come to our sites in so many different mindsets, or so many different situations, that at that point, if we started being cute, that's the last thing they want. All they want is where they can go to the nearest office to seek the service that they're looking for. So we had to take a very user-first, content-first strategy, but at the same time, while we were doing that, we saw our technology landscape changing. So mobile-first was imperative for us to do that. But at the same time, we didn't know what to do. This was 2012. This was 2011, actually, because we were part of like the whole um, planning strategy, the whole part of like what do we do from here? And the responsive design, responsive design article had just been published a few months ago. So we were still in a, in a kind of in a research mode of what do we do to make our sites responsive? But then we realized, you know what, yes, the te technology at only, only can drive the solution, but unless we change our business model, unless I change my entire team to support this, it's not gonna work. So earlier, when my team was just pretty much divided into people who were managing content, one version of the CMS, second version of the CMS, now it was more of a very overall model of like a 360 model, where our team had two arms. One was the product, the other was outreach. Because there's no value in having an awesome product if there is no outreach for the community and if they don't know how to use it, right? And like I said, our users are really not that sophisticated except for a very handy few. Most of our agencies don't even have dedicated content managers. They, you know, content management is like a third or fourth job for maybe like some admin or somebody else who just happens to know something about computers more than the others. And that's just how it has been. So it was, it was our goal to make sure we educate them about, you know, this is important. This is what we're putting together, but this is how you use it, right? So just build it and they'll come was not gonna work for us. We had to go out and talk to them and, and keep telling them about what we not just have built, but what we are also gonna be building. And to take this further, we need their input. We wanna make sure we build this together. It's not, a, it's not a centralized model where we just are physically detached from them. It's a centralized model because we can all reach out to them and we can work with them. So a lot of the stuff that we are doing, our agencies have a huge input in that. 
So clearly now, instead of just saying, hey, you know what, this is just a technology that we're giving you, this was more of a SaaS model. You know, this was more of a service. And this was more of a solution for them where, you know, you don't have to worry about anything. You don't even need to know HTML, right? That was the beauty of Drupal, which made it so, so user-friendly. Part of my team was doing research and development. Part of it was doing education and training. And then part of it was obviously doing marketing and making sure that the word gets around. What we did was obviously, you know, used a distro, a Drupal distro, open public. And we then started making that into a product that was essentially catered for the state of Georgia. So that means it, it, it has like all the sophisticated you know, product milestones that comes with developing a product. It has like all the development sprints in it. It has all the bug fixes that are constantly done. So we don't wait until something catches on fire and agencies open, start opening tickets saying, well, this is not working anymore. We know problems ahead of time. We had like now an internal set of people who are just dedicated to doing testing and focused on features. What are we doing? Where are we going? It's just not enough to keep the lights on. It's just like a very small piece of what we should be doing. Going forward, we need to make sure, you know, we need to feed and maintain our system. And that's, that's kind of like, you know, where we started moving towards, right? So we did a monthly platform release schedule. We had like a very hard date every month. And Anything that we can accommodate in it, we will, but we will push it at that time. So that also kept us on our toes as far as meeting the schedule, trying to push and accommodate as many changes in it. We also had like a bunch of other testing tools, like we had manual testing, A-B testing, we had automated visual regression testing, which otherwise we would not have caught. Little things, right? There are some things that just happens. There are so many ghost in the machine scenarios, like sometimes when they push something, all the dates for our attorney general suddenly switch to the date of the push. All the dates for the opinions, right? So imagine like, obviously everything is so formal and official up there, and suddenly an opinion which was like 10 years ago, it starts showing today's date, like they would flip out on that. But things like the visual regression testing tools immediately will catch that, otherwise where we have a blind spot for those things. So we needed to make sure like our testing effort was sophisticated and also complete for catching these things. And obviously, you know, there was a certain aspect of manual testing. If there are any regression issues, we need to go and, you know, identify before we push those out. And then obviously the module up upgrades and um, code audits, right? I mean, even though you're, you keep chugging along, at some point, like every year, all of us go for a physical, just to kind of have that overall view of how our health is doing. We need to have that occasionally. So we started doing that as well. So this is, this is essentially just to kind of maintain it, to make sure nothing, nothing goes below of what we already have set as a starting bar. But we also wanted new tricks, right? The puppy needs to learn new tricks. It's not going to be fun otherwise. So this is where our wish list came in. This is what we wanted to do. This is what our agency customers wanted to do. And we started making a wish list. Like, what do you want? Not, not everything that they wanted is something that could happen. But still, we want to make sure that they tell us everything that they want. And once they do that, then there is you know, a certain way of us to make those into enhancements. If we need to go reach out for new modules, if we need to you know, create content types, so be it. But we had a screening process in it, and we, we communicated that process with them, right? So going back to our overall strategy, if, if it's putting the users first in whatever the wish list item is, you know, that's, that's a good thing. Then it moves further on. Does it lessen the load for our content managers? Because at this point, we have like a little, you know, under 500 content managers across our enterprise that are using this platform on a day-to-day -day basis. If it helps them, that's, that's huge value, right? I mean, overall, does it provide value? Or is it just you know, trying to scratch the itch of just like two or three people, just because they want it? If that's the case, then yeah, sorry. We can't do that. It has to have an overall effect. And also, is it future-focused? Because things are going to change, right? Just because something's needed today 
you know, it doesn't mean we invest so much time into developing it. So we have to make sure that it stays relevant even in the coming years. What that happened, obviously, is it helped us then put it on a product roadmap. So everything that we did, the wish list, the prioritization, the scheduling of, you know, whatever made it through that, you know, we made sure we communicated. We added that onto a roadmap, which really kind of helped us now where we are standing, looking back, it helped us with the upper critical path. Because if you just take a quick look at where we started, right, in 2011, we were designing that platform. We were designing something for, yes, this is, this is my ideal of where we want to go, but also we were coming from a, such a, you know, dated environment. And it was such a huge shift. We also didn't want to make it into like a night and day change where the training efforts are just going to be overwhelming. So when in 2012 we completed the migration, we had one entire year to stabilize the platform. But that's when we were planning to make something happen, which we did the next year. We made the entire platform responsive. Within a period of months, we changed all of our sites to a responsive design model. Back then, I guess we were pretty close to about 70 sites. Because in 2012, we just launched georgia.gov as a responsive because that was a new technology back then. We wanted to see how it works. There were certain compromises we would have to make, making something responsive. So we knew there was some learning effort behind that. But once we did all of that, once we had our lessons learned, we started applying it towards the rest of the platform. Last year, we did a huge push for accessibility. We did have some level of accessibility baked in, but then we also made sure that you know, we want to be absolutely accessible as a state. We are not required to. The feds are required to, we are not required to be accessible, but that does not mean we should not be, right? So we partnered with Georgia Tech. We partnered with Georgia Tech. They have a dedicated accessibility division within their organization that just does this. They have disabled users working for them, Part of it is not just relying on tools, but also having real humans interact with your sites and then takeaways. And then we made those fixes back then. And then, of course, you know, going forward, we do have things on our roadmap, right? We do have, like, now it's been a while. Everyone's asking for, like, where the design is going now? We need a new design. So we are actually, instead of doing a very specific focused design um, effort, we are opening up our design solutions to making it more pattern-based, making it more you know, theme-based, where earlier our themes were really locked into a certain look and feel. Now our themes are opening up where we could actually choose different look and feel as far as colors and fonts are concerned. So we're looking at a UI redesign. We're looking at different content types. We're looking at you know, what we can do with data visualization. Because now that the rest of the platform is stabilized, agencies are asking for, like, oh, this is great. What can we do now? We have a bunch of data that is sitting in PDF files. It's sitting in Excel files. We would, we would love to do something else. Or us reaching out to them saying, hey, why do you have all these Excel files sitting up here? You know, you can just map it out. You can just make it, make it such that users can interact. They can actually apply filters and seek the data that they are looking for specifically. So when we got the needed nods by agencies, we know we have a community. Now we, have, we are looking for you know, ways to do that going forward. Also, this is like user-facing websites that we're using Drupal for. Now that agencies are having such great experience with that, they're like, hey, can we change your intranet to Drupal? Because we are using this amazing product that everybody uses, right? But I don't think anybody likes it. So we want to change it. We want to make sure you know, we, we like this part of our web experience. We want to do the same thing for our internal experience. So there are a lot of things that are happening. And I'm just kind of glad that we are able to accommodate that. So our next thing, next challenge was, you know, like I said, we, the old CMS that we were using, it was hosted in our own servers. Right, our own uh, data center using our own servers, but with Drupal, you know, should we be going by the same model, or do we do something else? So you know, the next challenge for us was like, where do you where do you house your puppy? Where do you put that you know dog dog house? Should be in, should be out. Like, should there be a little you know flexibility? So there was like a few hosting decisions, right? And this is where like organizations have very different philosophies about hosting. 
if everything that they are used to is no, 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 this is all PII, you know, it needs to be no data center, you know, the first thing I had to say was like nothing we do is PII. There's no reason why we should be still hosted in our data center and everything something has a hiccup, I open a ticket and wait for hours for someone to respond just to say, okay, I saw your ticket, I'm gonna find someone who can work on your ticket. And next day, somebody who is found to work on my ticket emails me saying, yeah, I got your ticket, I'm, I'm gonna put it in my queue, right? Nah, it just, yeah, I don't think so. So, we definitely were, aware that we needed a better uptime than 99%, right? 15 minutes a day is just not acceptable. There was also the security aspect, but, but that's okay, right? I mean, you know, all of our sites are either FISMA, FISMA moderate or FISMA low. And there's like nothing up there that requires me to have like a tier four SSA compliant or, or like a, you know, FedRAND compliant um, data center. If it, if it is, awesome. But if it's not, I mean, it's not like, you know, that's something that's going to stop us. So back when we started doing this, um, there was a little internal fight, but I'm, I'm kind of happy to say that we were able to just take everything out of our data centers and put it up on the cloud. And, and that just changed everything. That aspect of it literally changed everything for us. It, it freed up a lot of my time, it actually gave me some time over the weekends to spend with my family. But at the end of the day, who does it, right? My team is 10 people. My team is 10 people. We have 500 or so content managers. We have about 80 sites. We can do everything. We can do everything. So back when we were looking for Drupal as a solution, we also started looking for, you know, we need, we need vendors. We need vendors to help us do this because Drupal is not our expertise. We need someone who does, does this for a living. And if you're an organization in the same situation again, where if you're thinking if you can have internal resources support this, or if you have you know, vendors who can do this for you, give this, give this a deep thought and, and do your analysis over and over again and also factor in all the risks that come with both situations, both scenarios. In our case, you know, we were lucky enough to find like a really good set of vendors. Our RFP, we had multiple responses, but the response that won was a collaboration between Phase 2, who was our primary vendor, they had partnered with Acquia and MediaCurrent. We did our research. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna lie. We did our research. We looked up everything that they did, and not just this set of vendors, every, everybody else who applied for our RFP. We, we did our research, we made sure you know, their working styles, their inner working styles, the other projects that they are worked on kind of you know, were aligned with the way we like to work. In our RFP, we were open to ideas, but we were very specific about what our requirements were. After everything was done, right, one of the, one of the conversation pieces that stuck with our team and actually, I was reminded like a couple of weeks ago about that was um, we were told that, you know, reading your RFP, we could tell that you're not just looking for the IBMs and the Accentures of the world. Because essentially, that's where some of the other vendors were like, well, you know, this is clearly not something we could compete against. Because you're not, you don't maybe know what you're looking for. And if, if it comes to somebody else telling you what you're looking for and then saying, I can do this for you, uh, you know, we know how those projects end up. So you have to be pretty specific if you are in a position to write your RFPs and, and references are crucial, right? Because there are a lot of things that you would want to know about your vendors that otherwise would have been some, it's not good or bad, but it just, it's just a fit, right? Because as, as much as I say these are vendors because they responded to our RFP, they are our partners. They are not someone who we just like toss our requirements over the fence and then they go develop and you know, pitch us back the solution. No, it's a collaborative effort. I mean, we, we talk to them a lot more than we talk to the rest of our organization. They're, they're, they're extended part of our team. So going forward, you know, the model, the product side of it, the product side of it, exclusively worked with Phase 2 and Acquia because Phase 2 does all of our day-to-day -day software 
updates and maintenance, and then we do our hosting with Acquia. Again, our servers hosting internally, a lot of headache, at least in our situation. Because a government organization, right? I mean, we are pretty vulnerable to anything. Not just that the servers were clunky or whatever. I mean, you know, we constantly get DDoSed. If there is something that happens in Georgia that attracts international attention, sure, what's the first target? Georgia.gov. Go take it down or point it to something else and, you know, have our message up there about like why we disagree with whatever you are doing. So we had to make sure we were pretty, you know, immunized from, you know, that kind of threats and that kind of um, issues. So every time later that we saw that we were, we had a chance of getting DDoSed, all it took was a ticket open to Acquia saying, hey, there's a chance this might happen. And immediately they were like, all right, we keep an eye on it. And in many cases they said, well, we had to double we had to double your, um, you know, infrastructure to kind of make sure that we could accommodate that level of traffic before we could just make sure we block those IPs. It was a matter of 20 minutes. And I, I can't tell you how much of a value that adds to it. Just the fact that you open a ticket and both your vendors jump on a call to make sure nothing goes down and everything stays up and running. It's, it's amazing. It was like a totally different experience from what I was used to in my older model. So because this was all taken care of, my team now could focus on other things, right? We could be making sure that we could be focusing on training. We could be focusing on the governance aspect of what we were doing. The knowledge base, building of a knowledge base, policies, standards, guidelines. Every time we had any enhancements rolled into our product, we had release notes that informed our agencies, okay, this is happening. Remember you asked for this, it's done, go check it out. If you need training, we have a quarterly training, sign up for it. We'll teach you how to use it. If there is something that's big enough, we would schedule something special for it. Go sign up for it. We do webinars, we do training like on, on campus, as I would call it, or online. We have office hours where, you know, if someone's just struggling with something, one little thing, they don't have to sit through entire training. They just come sit one-on-one -on -one with us and we train them. Twice a year, we also do an event called Gov Talks. It's kind of tailored after, you know, the TED Talks model there. We just focus on certain aspect and then we have like 15, 20 minutes talks about that one thing. So we've had Gov Talks about mobile, social media, data, usability, content, all these issues, which are not really technology, but just best practices. These are like industry issues where everyone is going, and we don't want to be, as a government, reactive. There's no reason why it is, you know, government to be reactive to any of this, when a lot of the other aspects and a lot of the other pieces of government really are like ahead of technology, you know, compared to the private sector. So we make sure like everyone comes in and they talk, they, you know, understand about all the industry best practices, what the standards are. We keep working on updating our state standards. And once we do that, for example, like a few years ago, we updated our accessibility standards saying like everyone has to be accessible if you are part of the state government. And you know, that led for the entire platform to be accessible. We talk, talk to them about what's happening with our platform, our training issues, right? So amazing stuff now that we can actually focus on because we don't have to worry about servers being down or you know, a backup didn't happen. So the last part of this presentation is, all right, so what's the ROI, right? What's the ROI here? So the success criteria, obviously, for an ROI is, did it save you any money? What, how, did it, how did it affect like, going forward as far as your business is concerned? How did the conversion happen? And then you know, what is the efficiency here? Honestly, when we did our business case, we, all we focused was on the cost savings. Like, this is how much it's going to cost us. Back then, we said it was going to cost us $5 million over the next five years. And that's a great message for the suits, right? So it was like, wait a minute, $5 million? All right, let's talk. So 
That was our key to at least get the conversation going. But to be very honest with you, when it comes to even cost savings, it is not apples to apples. It's apples to oranges because everything changed once we moved to Drupal, right? We could splice everything that we are doing and like one little piece of what we do now is what we did before. But everything, that everything else that we are able to do now because we just had this technology take care of everything that we used to be able to have nightmares and sleepless nights. So just to kind of give you a glimpse, right, of what our 2012 operation model was, that between our support staff, our hosting cost, licensing, and professional services, my total operational budget was $1.5 million. Every year, we were told it was going to have a 10% increase as far as the licensing cost was going to go. Also, sometimes maybe for our hosting and support. I had four dedicated Java developers making sure my two versions of the old CMS don't go down. So my support staff, actually, as you can see, was the highest. And then professional services is something that we had to get in case something goes wrong, which was not covered under their regular support which almost nothing was. So every time something happened, they were like, yeah, that's not actually a support thing. We're going to have to change this because of the implementation, blah, 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 professional services. So professional services money, that was actually something that I had you know, put towards future-facing issues, was getting used up and just keeping the lights on. Jumping back to 2015, my cost of operations, you know, the biggest difference was it was a little over half a million. The support staff was significantly low because we have just one Drupal developer on site. Everything else is our professional services, which happens with phase two. We have a certain set of hours that we go through every month to kind of make sure that accommodates our enhancements, our features. And if anything that goes beyond that clearly has to come from agencies as a request, and in that case, our agencies pay for it. But zero licensing costs. How awesome is that, right? I mean, obviously, everyone here knows that as a part of the open source, but this is amazing. And next to each other, crazy. Just crazy. And this is, this is just the cost saving aspect of it just the cost saving aspect of it because essentially it was a huge reduction it was about 82 percent reduction in the hosting costs 82 percent we just didn't need the rest of the peanut butter that came with you know the rest of the services that were offered to the 5,000 servers that are hosted at the data center my 27 servers just need some basic upkeep and that's all i need i don't need to pay for everything else but it was just not the model that i could choose so my hosting cost dipped, 82%, no licensing fees, one developer, right? So, I mean, honestly, this, this really started proving like we might save more than $5 million in the next five years. But here's also the thing, right? This, the old model would be at an incremental cost because we are definitely paying 10% more every year for licensing and support. We were also paying more for hosting. So if we just kept professional services the way they were, if we did not give a single dollar raise to our developers and hope they didn't quit, this is what we would be looking for every year. Last year, that cost would be almost under $2 million just to operate our content management system. But the next aspect of our ROI is not just the cost, but also what happened with the conversion. In 2012, we have 56 sites, and we were, we were losing customers. The moment we implemented Drupal, by the time we hit that stable state in our critical path, we started getting you know, contacted by agencies left and right, because now they started seeing what we did with that. They wanted, they wanted a piece of that. They wanted to be in there. They saw how futuristic it was. In 2015, we had 77 sites. 
And this is just a site count. I mean, a site is a site, right? I wish I could say that if every site was exactly the same, but it's not. In the last couple of years, we have added Department of Revenue, Department of Labor, and right now we are working with Department of Driver Services. Between these three sites, I don't think there is any Georgian, unless you're a baby, that you don't interact with these three sites. At some level, you do interact with that. So now we are overall touch point with every constituent of Georgia is humongous. Just to kind of give you a usage ROI, other than just the site count, in 2012, we just had about you know, 57 million page views. In 2015, it's 107 million page views. Our total sessions went up almost twice. Our unique users went up almost twice. But our mobile and tablet traffic, now granted, this is not just because of Drupal, it's just the overall climate, right, of how mobile traffic is exploding. But still, I can imagine us having the old technology and having about 18 million, or almost 19 million mobile users. All of those 19 million mobile users would have a terrible experience because we are not able to cater to that. And we are actually looking at some mobile users that are exclusively mobile. They don't own a laptop or a desktop. If, if they need to, they have to go to the nearest public library because all they can do is afford a phone and a data plan. And if we are not useful to them, if they're looking for government services, it's a big fail on us. So really happy that this is happening now. But these are the tangible costs, right? These are the costs that we can actually quantify. There were some other things too, efficiency. Our old CMS, believe it or not, it would take you 15 or 20 minutes to do anything per content push, be it adding content or editing content because the workflow was so convoluted. You had to click like a dozen of buttons, go back, change a certain state, push it again. It goes in a queue, make sure if something that needs to be published like right now, you go and have like a secondary effort of making sure it publishes right then. With Drupal, under a minute. It's email, right? You type and you send, it's gone, it's up. So easy. So, I mean, I can't even imagine like standing here and telling you if everyone saved 19 minutes every time they wanted to do something with it, I think we have like some 50 or 60,000 content items that get pushed every month. The amount of cost savings as far as just efficiency is concerned. It's amazing, it is just amazing. But there were some hidden cost savings. Remember those servers I talked about that were like clunkers, 10 years old? So out of those 27 servers, three servers died. So we had to get new servers. Those three servers were 10 years old, so back when we had bought them, our licensing cost was based on the 10-year-old server model, which was just one CPU. The new servers were four CPU, 16 core. Our old systems licensing model, if applied to those three new servers, actually was coming up to $740,000 for just those three servers because the new servers now had 16 cores. So per core license was just through the roof. I can't even imagine justifying doing that for all of those 27 servers. And thankfully, you know, sometimes like bad processes help you. When we had applied or rather requested three servers, it took us 16 months to get them. By then we had moved on to Drupal. So by the time I got my email saying, those servers arrived, I was like, thank you, we don't need them. Find someone else to use them. So 740K, nah, we didn't have to spend those. So anyway, concluding, the value definitely outweighed our cost, right? The value was less tremendous. Value of moving to Drupal just was tremendous as far as the cost was concerned. But also, you know, if you are doing this, regardless of the technology, it applies to anything, not just Drupal. Just to seek the value in what you're trying to do. And, and not, don't be focused on cost, because there's so many like, cost effective and so many low cost solutions that eh, otherwise you still be back to square one. 
Um, we stayed user-centric, user future-focused, and that helps us a lot. That helps us a lot. And you know, Drupal being Drupal and so flexible, it really helped us succeed with that strategy. And, and you know, last but not the least, right? I mean, take chances. Take chances, because back in the day when we were proposing this solution, I was told to my face that if this fails, I'm going to be out of a job. And honestly, I was not a Drupal expert, but I just felt like if so many people are being successful with this, there's no reason why this will fail. So it was a true chance. And I mean, I had a great team that supported me. I mean, this is like, I'm just happy to be here talking to you, right? But I mean, there's, there's this huge team behind here, a huge team of 10 people, but still. They are, they are toiling, making sure this is all up and successful back at the ranch, and you know, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing that they supported this vision back then. We were trying to make this change. So there's, there's nothing wrong in taking chances, making sure you know, things work. And then, I mean, we, we invested in our puppy, and then eventually when it became like a big dog, right? I mean, everyone was like singing praises. It was like, how do you do this? And then how could we do this? Blah, 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 blah. So anyway. If you are interested in any more information about this project, about what you just saw, you know, we have our website, interactive.georgia.gov. Feel free to go there. There is a bunch of blog posts that we write. Every team member that you know, is part of this project you know, has something or the other contribution as far as knowledge base, knowledge transfer, our training materials up there, you know, all of our Gov talks, videos, and everything is up there. If you think this has been any beneficial for you, I, I would really request you all to just tweet to the Georgia Gov team. I'm, I'm really lucky to be here talking about this, but they're the ones who actually make it happen. So, you know, it, it will be, Awesome, awesome if you just kind of tell them that you know, this project has helped you even a little bit in helping you in your strategy or your choices that you are making. So by all means, do, do let them know that you know, this, is, this is going well or however you think, whatever this is. Thank you, and if you have any questions. Yes. Yes, so one thing I kind of forgot to do while I was doing the whole thing is, I have a team member here with me, Kendra Screen. Uh, Kendra Screen, she is our director of product. And you know, the half of the team that I showed you about product and outreach, she leads product. So right now, Kendra is focused on the D8 roadmap. And we are looking at, obviously, you know, the D8 features and what's happening. Clearly, it is not you know, one site, right? It's a platform. So there is, there is a lot of research that we are going to be doing um, as far as moving to D8. We are also working closely with Phase 2 to make sure like, what their plans are as far as open public is concerned. And um, I don't think we are going to be like the early adopters at this point for D8. We would want to wait until things mature, things settle down a bit. Um, but going forward, uh, I do want to make sure like we are not like a very late adopter as well. We do want to leverage what you know the awesomeness that you know D8 is bringing. But at this point, I mean, really, there is no date at this point on our roadmap. Any other questions? Yes. Sure. So, I mean, honestly, phase two had a lot to do with that, but we selected Omega, which is the base team. And then based on that, we created sub-themes, which, which, which kind of differed in the look and feel aspect of it. But everything was driven from the base team Omega. Okay, so you developed your own Yes, Omega. correct. And also, when we made everything responsive, we made Omega responsive. And, and phase two was actually you know, kind of awesome enough to kind of get the person, Jake, who did the Omega team, make it responsive for us. How many sub did you end up with? sub -team. So we started off with 12, and um, Kendra helped me. Now we have like 16. 16, yeah, 16 right now. 
because then you know DNR joined us and we didn't have anything friendly for environment. So we're like, all right, we'll make you an environment friendly team. Yeah. Somebody else had a question up here. Maybe I answered them already. Any other questions? Yes, go ahead, Brian. Can you, can you talk a little bit about your multi-site strategy? You know, uh, how many different sites run on how many code bases? What's the process at a high level for uh, you know, vetting a new potential customer, a new agency for a new multi-site? Yeah. What does it look like to actually get them off the ground? Okay, sure. I can, I can start off with this and maybe, you know, Kendra, feel free to chime in here, but um, come in here and talk. Um, we, we still have a single code base. So um, if any new requirement that comes in right now, we, we try to obviously make sure that we are having the same model. Unless it's a completely different requirement, which is right now we're working on this project for a school report card. And we are using a Drupal-based solution called DCAN. And for that, you know, we have like a completely different code base now. So that is not even sharing our same hosting servers. But um, if there is something specific that is needed, we would develop that as a content type. To give you an example, we host the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, and you know they have like these found remains of people and um, you know missing persons uh, listing, blah blah. Now we had to like create like very specific views, um, content types for them, but that just applied to that site. That is not across. Now there is an emergency content type that shows up on every site, but we have to handpick certain agencies who can actually control that. So if there's like another, you know, Snowmageddon in Atlanta, then you know, you know, GMA or um, the governor's office or us can actually go in and add like an alert that shows up on like all these sites at the same time. So there are certain aspects that we make sure that certain sites have access to. But also, none of it is like so different enough that it requires its own code base. We are still managing everything together. Do you have anything to add to that? <laughs> we try not to, but sometimes, you know, the commissioner wants to look different, right? So, yeah, all right, you get your theme. But that's, that's what we're doing now, is we are going forward with more of an open theme approach, which, which Kendra named it Prince, not Prince Ali, but Aladdin, because it opens your world uh, from what they're used to, is they're not bound to colors and fonts. They're not bound to like a certain look and feel. Um, they can pick and choose, and we help them pick and choose. So regardless of like the sub theme that we are using, we can still have different sites look different using the same sub theme. Because right now, or like a certain sub theme, all the sites created still have the same look and feel as far as the colors and fonts are concerned. But just the modules that they are using and the placement is different. That what kind of makes them, you know, uh, individual snowflake if you can. Yeah. There are, I guess, you know, 
different um, expectations from agencies. If they just pick and choose one of our existing themes, then you know it's easy. Then we just build it, we train them, they start moving their own content. This is something we really stress on our agencies. You own content. We are not really going to be, we can help you with best practices of content, but we, you own your content. You need to really understand the whole content uh, value. So they move their content. We help them with analytics, we help them with strategy. But you know, once they move everything, we do our internal testing, we manage domains and everything, and then you know, we, we decide. There have been instances where we have launched somebody within a month or within like, our fastest was like almost two weeks once, right? I mean, it was like a really small site for like a um, commission or something like that. But there have been 10 months, almost a year now with um, the one of the recent ones that we're getting ready to launch because content has been like the most piece that we struggle with or if they need new functionality as you know Kendra was saying locations so if they are looking for locations you know we are not just going to build it for them then we start going back to every other agency that has that need and we find out like what their needs are and then we kind of like you know put them together as far as like okay these are like the most common needs so our MVP really needs to have that in there, then we can make it very specific to maybe just driver services or this particular agency. But yes, it can, I mean, it's literally like, can take like a month or a year. Yeah, because content's so easy when we start the project, right? And when we actually get to the content phase, they're like, oh, who's gonna be doing this? So, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, you had a question. Um, yeah. So the operational budgets you mentioned, yeah. uh, that's just keeping the lights on, right? Is that, or is that including the growth of your platform? So it actually did include the growth of the platform, but in the previous life, that consumed just keeping the lights on. Because the licensing and support model was such that any issue that we had suddenly was like an enhancement to the product. So we had to spend a lot of our growth money into fixing issues. But with the new model, it is definitely you know, a big part of our growth budget. Yeah, we just have one Drupal developer, and sometimes we kind of just divvy up, you know, the work between what she can do versus what the professional services need to do. If if any change actually affects the entire platform, then you know we definitely have phase two in the mix to make sure you know we have like the overall view of how it's going to affect. But if it's like, for example, you know, an agency wants a chat module to go up, um, that is something we can easily do internally. So we do that, and before we actually push it, we might request Facebook to just take a look at, like, just, just make sure it doesn't break anything else. And, you know, that's done then. So, I mean, our, our Drupal developer is, like, 100% dedicated in, you know, making sure that she's focused on enhancements, which she can handle. But some of the enhancements that you know are beyond her go to phase two. But phase two is definitely kind of phase, uh, focused on the maintenance and the patches and the upgrades. So if you had a major temperature rise, you would expect, like you were saying, you won't be around probably down the road. That would be an entirely separate temp budget. Correct. Yes, that that will not be part of this operational budget. That I would I would pitch it as like a key milestone within, you know, we need to kind of upgrade this. And just the way we went through the initial migration, that kind of costed us a little, you know, kind of more than what our operational budget was. But you just kind of do that within like one year, and then you're back to the stable state. Hmm? Well, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate you all showing up.